All right, this is this week's lecture on syllables and supersegmentals. Uh, everything is okay, just a little family thing. So I'll talk about syllables and supersegmentals first, then I'll talk about the first conlang check-in afterwards. And there's no workshop for this one. I recommend you do it on your own time for the sake of the conlang check-in, but no submission. So we're gonna understand syllable formation, tone, pitch, length, and stress. And we're gonna take a look at each of these levels. So what you might not realize is that a lot of these things operate independently of each other. And we'll see different tiers and how languages do it. Then you can use this sort of systematic method of assigning tone and all these things in your own language that we'll see today. So phonotactics, which literally means sound strategy, is all about the constraints on which sounds can appear together in words or not. So I have five words in English. Well, they could be English words down below. And you have some intuition about which ones can be English words. So pralstico is not standard, but it sounds English. The combinations of sounds work. Falstico, this does not work because of the PF at the beginning. Uh, we do not have PF words. Pralstick is fine. Plarstico is fine. And then pralstico, this is an issue since there's no way in English that we can have five consonants back to back. So you might have a phonotactic that says that you can't have... P followed by another consonant, for example, at the beginning of a syllable. So maybe there's like a vowel here, and then there's some other consonants to finish the syllable. So you might have a constraint that says uh, no PC clusters or something. So this would not allow um, PF, this would not allow PT, but this would also not allow things like PL. So maybe we need some sort of constraint that is going to allow PL and will allow PR. So we're not going to go too deep into the theory of this. Uh, I just wanted to show you some phonotactics and how you can visualize them. So this is a phonotactics diagram for Italian syllables. So what this shows is this shows all of the acceptable clusters of consonants that appear before the vowel. So maybe the vowel right after here is like ah. So this would tell you that we could do S, P, L, and then a vowel. Or we could do S and then a vowel. Or we could do Z and then M and then a vowel. So this little chart shows all of the consonants and which can be, you know, together. So if we take a look in our list here, we can do S, K, R. So that's acceptable. Can we do Z, G, L? We can do Z, G, and we can do L. So that's going to work in Italian, but not in English. Uh, can we do Z, L, R? No, we can't, because if we do Z and then we do L, we can't put an R after it. So Z, L, R is not going to work. And in this language, is S, W going to work? SW. And the answer to this one is also no, because if we take an S from our main consonant block, uh, there's no post consonant that we can take. So S, W, so SW is not okay in Italian. So we can see some differences here with Italian and English, primarily in numbers two and four. Two, they can do something we can't, and in four, we can do something that they can't. So that's one way of visualizing these things. Another thing for English is to use these sort of charts. So this just takes a look at the combinations for the beginning of a syllable and the end of a syllable. And there are some things they don't include, like for instance, the GW down here, because in English words, this does not appear. Um, it does appear, though, in loan words, so words like uh, guacamole. You know, this is a Spanish words we took, so we have the gu cluster there. But in natural English words, we don't see it. We don't see any TLs, DLs, FLs, or pua, bua, or fua. And again here, uh, if you have a word like fuego in Spanish, we can pronounce it with an FW, um, but it's not a part of regular English vocabulary. So coda just means the end of a syllable, and we can see some parts there too, but this is just a nice way that some people lay out their charts. When things get bad, and we see this with a lot of constructed languages, is that they just come out as lists, as lists. And sometimes this is the best way to do it because there's so much information, but it can be a little bit difficult to follow. Um, so for example, instead of putting everything in the chart, they've broken parts up into pieces. So this part talks about, you know, what's acceptable for an onset at the beginning, if you just have a single consonant. 
Uh, what about an onset with groups of consonants? And even here in the third line, um, so some more information about stuff that happens in between syllables. So maybe not the onset there, but we do get some onset information in point four. So a lot of this information is what we saw in the charts just condensed into a list form, and that's a little bit harder to read. So that is um, the basics here. So now we're going to take a look at different levels of explanation. So consonant vowel templates, syllables, and so on. So Arabic is an interesting language because what they do is uh, they use consonants and vowel templates to give information about the word that they're saying. So this is a verbal example. So how this works is there's three different tiers. There's the consonant and vowel tier. So we call this the CV tier. And this is where the skeleton for your word goes. In other words, it's just a bunch of consonants and vowels, but we don't know what they are yet. And in this particular configuration, if you get a verb that's a consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, that means it has this influencing aspect. So this is a type of meaning that we don't have in English built into our grammar. So in terms of how this is done, we see that we have a consonant tier, KTB, meaning the roots. So we can line up the consonants on top and attach them one to one. We have vowels to do with um, active and passive as well as aspect. So these are the vowels are UI. So what we do here is we write out the vowels UI down below. We double up with the first one and then we just have a single attachment for the second one. And what we get in the end is kutib or kutib a, needing a morpheme at the end. And this means he was corresponded with. So this is an interesting type of morphology. So interesting type of sound system and word system where the actual structure of the word, the order of the consonants and vowels, how many there are matters. So I'd like you to try doing this. I'm giving you a new set of three bits of information. So CV, C, C, V, C. This means an intensive aspect. Uh, HQ, R, R, consonants, so we'll write them up there, and a ah is our vowel. So the idea is that you link one to one from left to right with consonants. So we can do h with the first c, q with the second c, but now we have nothing for the remaining c's. So what we're going to do is we're going to spread this consonant over to the other c's. So we're going to end up with three q's in the end. The vowels are going to be the same way, we line it up, we see any remaining vowels, we're going to spread it. So our final form is going to be H, A, Q, Q, A, Q. And then we have a meaning here. So this would mean he realized something. So to be true, that would be a verb. A is an act of perfect aspect. So had, so he had, um, it had been true or something like that. And then intensive, meaning that there's an intent behind it. So to be true with intent is to realize something. So now here is another question talking about the limits of these sorts of things. So imagine we had a CV, 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 sorry, sorry, CV, CV, C structure. So I'm going to actually do this up top here, just so we have space. I'm telling you that the consonants are H, K, Q, and B, and I'm telling you that the vowels are U and I. So the vowels have a nice link. And if we follow the consonants, we're going to get something like this. And then the B is going to be stranded with nothing that it can attach to. So the question is, can this verb then therefore be forms? And it's going to depend on the language because there's a few things that could happen here. One thing that could happen is it just can't attach to a consonant at all. So in the end, we don't end up with the B appearing. What could happen too in some languages is maybe it also attaches to that same consonant and it becomes sort of like an affricate, where they're both pronounced at the exact same time, or very, very close in pronunciation. So basically no vowel or other sound in between. So a few things that could happen to accommodate this. Uh, you might even see the sound changing to a vowel or something like that. It really depends on the language. So CV templates are something that you can use in your word formation for your sounds to say, I want CVCs to have a certain meaning, CVCCs to have a certain meaning, and so on.
Usually you want to use more than one syllable though, otherwise your meanings will get, um, you won't have as many ways to create meanings. Another thing that uses uh, CV structure is length. So in Japanese, for example, we'll see Japanese a couple times because it's a language I'm quite familiar with uh, linguistically. Um, they make a distinction between sounds, so sound length. So whether you say kita or kita, the meaning is different. So in one case, you have a double vowel. So this I sound is being linked to two different vowels, while in the case below, the I sound is only being linked to one vowel. And we see the same thing with bidu and biru. So in this case of bidu, we just have a short I sound. It's taking up one vowel space. And in biru, so beer, that's going to take up two vowel spaces. So what these are is these are lengthened sounds. So if you ever see like a, an A with a length or a P with a length, this just means you take the previous sound and you pronounce it a little bit longer. So kita versus kita or happy versus happy. Now, the main thing that everything is built off of is syllables. So a syllable has three parts. This might look a little bit different if you've taken a linguistic course. I'm just simplifying the syllable structure a little bit. Basically, at the top, we have our symbol sigma, which stands for the syllable. And it's broken up into three parts. Uh, the nucleus, which is the center, which is required. This is where your vowel is hosted, and syllables are built around vowels. The onset are going to be consonants that appear before the nucleus, and the coda will be the consonants that appear after. So we can use CV structure again to describe our syllables. So in the case of threat, there's four sounds, th, er, et, one syllable. So two consonants, a vowel and a consonant. So we call this a CCVC syllable. In the case of steals, CC, V, CC, and high would be CV. This is just one vowel here. So uh, these are ways that we can abbreviate syllables and we can draw out syllables. And what's going to happen is our phonotactics is going to determine what can appear in onsets and what can appear in codas. So the phonotactics directly influences the syllable. So I want to show you what you can do with syllables. So you can use words to create new words in different languages or different dialects or just playing language games. So a popular game is Pig Latin, which we saw in the first lecture. Uh, have becomes av, a stay becomes uh, a stay. And in the case of here, we have the words pig on and strength. And we want to get the outputs ig pay, on ye, and ink stray. So if we just take a look at how these words are formed, and we take pig, we can turn this into a two-syllable pig Latin word. So what we do is we're going to keep everything in the nucleus and coda the same. What we're going to do is we're going to take the initial onset, we're going to bring it to the next syllable and put it in the next syllable's onset, and then we're going to add the sound A in the nucleus to get a new syllable. So we get igpe. So we did the same thing. We took this onset, we moved it over to the onset of the second syllable, and then we added a. So can we do this with on to get on ye? Well, we can take a, n, we can add a in our nucleus, but we see something different in this one. We get a y sound, on ye. So if you don't have anything to put in the onset because there's nothing to move, we add a y sound. So now using the same strategy for our strength, we get ankh. We're going to take the entire onset of the previous syllable, str, and then add a to get ankh stray. So Pig Latin is a very systematic language game. And these are things you can do with syllables to create new words. You can have some sort of structure which says, I want to take a one syllable word, turn it into a two syllable word, and this is the process that I'm going to do. Or I'm going to take a two syllable word, turn it into a one syllable word, and this is what I'm going to delete. So these are powerful components of syllables that you can use to create words and have fun with. Now there are some universal principles for syllables. This is the only thing with the universal principles we'll talk about today. And that is the fact that every language we see has CV syllables. So every language can do CV. This is the only requirement of languages. A second requirement, or a second thing that happens in most languages is what's called the maximum onset principle. And this basically says that assume we have a word like foxes. 
And we have two syllables. We have the one for fuck and the one for sis. And the question is, okay, if we start adding sounds into the syllables we have to, we have this weird confusion here. What do we do with the K and the S? Well, here's where we listen to phonotactics. We know, based on how languages work, that both of these consonants want to be in an onset. They prefer onsets. But if we ask ourselves, can KS start a word in English? X, X, something, like C, -si, Xop. We don't get that. We can't start words with K and S together, which means that the K and the S are gonna be split. The K can no longer go in the onset of the next syllable. It has to be in the coda of the previous one. So we get foxes for the word foxes. So that's another way that syllables work. And then we have a couple chains that we can talk about. So this is like, if a language has this syllable, it must have this syllable. So you can sort of follow the two chains here. So if something has this, if a language has a CCCV syllable, it's gonna have a CCV syllable, and it's gonna have a CV syllable. In other words, because in English we have STR, that means we're also gonna have ST, and we're gonna have S or T as well. It might not be necessarily those same letters, um, but, you can think of the general concept as being that if a language has more complex syllables, it'll have simpler syllables. And we have a chain for this as well with vowel uh, with syllables starting with vowels. So if you have a VCCC syllable, you'll have a VCC syllable, which means you'll have a VC syllable, which means you'll have V syllables. And if you ever have a syllable that ends with a consonant, that also means you can have a syllable that starts with a consonant. So if you're trying to break some conventions, then you just have to ignore some step in the chain. So here's an exercise on Alphanu. So this is a constructed language that has a phonemic inventory, but it didn't have any syllable structures or phonotactics. So I was going to in class have this as an exercise where you create your own um, phonotactics and syllable system where you break a universal principle. So just to illustrate how this could happen is I could have a phonotactic system that says, okay, I can only ever have a consonant on its own, so this is acceptable. I can never have two consonants back to back um, at the beginning of a word, but at the end of a word, I can't have a single consonant and I need to have two consonants at the end of a word. So I could have some phonotactics that looks like this. And this means that I'm going to get CV syllables and I'm going to get VCC syllables, um, well, really, these are optional at the beginning and end. So um, basically what would happen then is I would have VCC syllables, but I wouldn't have VC syllables, and that means I wouldn't have CVC syllables, so this would break. So just an example of how we can mess with our syllable structures and phonotactics. So now I'll talk about supersegmentals go into pitch, tone, and this other fun stuff. So pitch is mainly to do with how many times your vocal folds are vibrating per second. Men average around 120 cycles per second, women around 220 cycles per second. This is why women's voices are typically higher. A higher frequency, higher pitch. You also have what's called the thyroid cartilages in your throat. So this is sort of surrounding the sides of your throat. And when you do a higher pitch, uh, those cartilages will tense up and that will also raise your larynx a little bit. So there's some combined action. Now, pitch is a blanket term that is used to describe pitch accent languages, tone languages, intonation, and everything. So when we talk about pitch, normally we think about high and low, and this is what you think of with pitch accent languages. But you have tonal languages that have more contrasts, and then there's also use of intonation, which we'll see later in the course, where this is a pitch change, but it's not about individual words, it's about the sentence. So Japanese is a pitch accent language, which means that each syllable is pronounced either high or low, and this is relative pitch. So it's not like everyone has to be at 250 hertz for high and 100 hertz for low, it just depends on your voice. So here we have two comparisons. On the left we have hashi and hashi. So hashi, hashi. High then low, hashi, versus hashi, 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 which is low then high. So the sounds are the same, but the tone is different, the pitch is different. Uh, there's also the case of ima versus ima. Ima, ima, 
So now versus living room. And I'm exaggerating a little bit here just so we can hear the contrast. So normally what happens here is you have syllables that are attached to your vowels and consonants. So ima. And then above the syllable tier, we list the pitch or the tone. So this is high tone and then low tone. So the e syllable has high tone, the ma syllable has low tone. Or alternatively, in the case of living room, you just switch the two. So pitch accent is just about the high-low contrast, and this is usually used to separate word meaning. So if a language is a pitch accent language, that means that the pitch is affecting the meaning of the words. Now with pitch accent, normally there are some rules. So this is another good way to make new words and also just to assign pitch in general. So in compound words, we do some shifting. So in the case of a city like Shibuya, Shibuya, where you have this um, higher pitch on the middle syllable, bu, when you add the, the suffix meaning city to it, what we end up doing is we end up shifting the accent. So it ends up being on the penultimate syllable, even though we have some new added bit of information. So changing from u to a, where the high pitch. So shibuyashi, shibuyashi. That's not the best pronunciation, but get that higher pitch in ya. Shibuyashi versus shibuya. The list gets very complicated for the rules, um, but they have some other constructions in Japanese where they have single syllables that have like a single consonant in them. So mm, or, uh, for the sake of uh, an analyzing the language. Uh, and in some cases, this even shifts. So in the case of sendai, so sendai, where you have high stress on or high pitch on the first syllable, it, it turns into sendai shi. Sendai-shi. So instead of the first syllable being a high pitch and then the rest being low, that first syllable ends up becoming low, the next two are high, and then we get low in the end. So you can make some pretty complicated rules depending on the sounds. But pitch accent is really just an aside to introduce you to tone. So I'm sure you're all familiar with tone. Uh, tone is just word pitch. And normally tone has some sort of change with it. It's not completely stable the entire time. So Mandarin is one of the most popular examples. There's five different tones. There's a high, high rising, low rising, high falling, and neutral. And depending on which tone you use, you're going to get a different meaning. So are you saying mother, hemp, horse to scold, or are you just asking a question? I like the Vietnamese diagram because they show tones not as just markers on letters, but as actual pitch diagrams. So Vietnamese is six tones, some people analyze it as eight tones, but we can see the time course for each of these. So each of these colors is a different tone, and we can see, for instance, the hoi tone here. It starts at a middle frequency, it's pretty short, and then it ends low. So this is a quicker word, while the ngang tone is a mid tone that stays mid for quite a little bit of time. So that's the middle one. So what you could do for each of these and what a lot of languages do is they assign different tiers to their tone frequencies. So they might say the system is a one, two, three, four, five distinction. And let's say this mid-tone is what's called a three, three. So it stays at three and it ends at three. While something like, I don't know, the first tone in blue here, the high tone, it starts at a four and then it goes to a five. Or in the case of the long one at the bottom, the one in dotted, it might start as a three and go to a one. So this can give you information about the length and also the relative tone, the relative pitches that you're going to. So there are some symbols for this. Uh, I want to show you calm. So this is another language that is said to have 15 tones, but uh, the Tones in open syllables, so open syllables meaning syllables that end in a vowel, and in closed syllables, ones ending with a consonant, uh, they have slightly different tones. I mean, they're, they're used again, some are shorter, some are longer, some are different, um, but the speakers of the language classify them as having separate tone systems, so a nine tone system and a six tone system giving you 15 in total. But you can see the different variation here and how difficult it might be to learn some of these languages if you don't have tone in your own. Now, closely related to tone is musical notes. 
So you can think of tone in language being like a relative pitch. So depending on your voice, what's normal, we just go higher or lower. With the musical Conlang Sol Re Sol, they use all of the Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do, and the pitch has to be accurate. So if you're saying Do, which is the C sound, you need to be saying it at the C pitch, for Re at the D pitch, at Mi at the E pitch, and so on. So it's a very musical language. And all of the words are just made from these syllables. So they use Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti in order to create the actual syllables for pronunciation. So you'll get like Mi, Sol, where we just end with an L there, we're not doing the A. Ah. Or Sol, Mi, which is bad. Do, Re, Do, which is time. Mi, Do, Fa, La, abandon. So these are all very musical words that should be sung at the appropriate scale. One interesting thing they do here with words, and this is something more safe for uh, morphology, is if you take a look at the words good and mad, uh, sorry, good and bad, these are antonyms, they're opposite. And if you take a look at the syllables, well, these are also just in the opposite order. So antonyms are just the original word, but in the opposite syllable order, which I think is really cool. So it's sort of like uh, for um, happy is like an, you're rising up from me to soul, and then bad, you're going from soul to me, you're going down. I think that's really interesting. So one of the one of the amazing things about this language is because there's like a pitch scale, it's it's set. You do not need words to speak this. You don't need a mouth. You can use a musical instrument and get the music across because as long as people can identify C, D, E, F, G, A, B, you're fine. Um, you could turn it into Morse code. So door knocks, whistles, uh, barks, whatever. Or you could even use like the rainbow. So Roy G. Biv. So instead of using Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, you're using red, orange, yellow, um, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And the creator of this language said that what you could do is at night by shooting rockets of each of the seven colors listed above, always separating every syllable as needed, then pausing briefly between each word, you could speak the language, which is, I think, a little bit extravagant and one of the most expo uh, expensive languages out there. So... Not too much about Sol Re Sol. Um, a lot of these languages are built more so around the word creation and meaning. That's where things get interesting. When it comes to sounds, they just, you know, I think having more linguistic backgrounds better because it gives you the tools to use things and languages don't seem to be too interesting. At least a lot of them on the tone front. So word melodies, uh, you normally hear these with tone. You don't usually use the word word melodies, but you can think of words with tone as having word melodies. And usually you might get a word that has say three high tones in it. So I'll just make one up like alama and each of these are high. So the assumption is, is that each syllable has its own high tone. It's like a high, high, high word. But in reality, what's actually happening is we say it's a high word and then each of those three syllables, so alama, is getting that same tone. So in other words, you can think of the first syllable as having high tone. The rest of the syllables don't have any tone, but there's nothing left to assign tone to it. So that high tone just spreads. So we'd say that a word with three syllables that's all high is just a high tone. It's a high tone melody word. So because the tone is the same the entire word, we say it's a level tone. If the tone changes, then it would be called a contour tone. So things are changing. Uh, let's say that this word alama was a little bit different in the case that for the first syllable it was high and then the next two were low. In this case, we'd say it's a high-low melody. So we can write out our tones from left to right, high, low, connect them one to one. The one at the end of the word doesn't have any tone, so the L, the low tone spreads. In other words, the lines aren't crossing, it's just giving tone over. So I wanted to show you this because this is another powerful tool for word creation and syllable creation. Um, we can just have a word, a melody, and some convention for assigning tone. So for example, in the word oboe, this has two syllables. It has two vowels, so this is how we can tell. There's O and bow. I'm saying that the word melody is low, high, low, and we're going from left to right. So this means that I can take my word, 
I can build my syllables, and then I can assign my tones L, H, L in this order. So what's going to happen is we're going to link these up one to one, and then we see an L is stranded off. Well, L has to attach to something, so it's going to attach to that final syllable. So we end up with a low tone syllable, and then a high low syllable. So we end up with a level tone on our first syllable, and then a contour tone on our second one. So we get O and then BO, so high and then low. In the case of ekue, we have three syllables here because we have three vowels, e, ku, and e. Uh, so this is a high tone, so we're assigning it high. It only goes to one syllable, so we spread it to the rest so that we can get ekue. Now bisone, sort of same idea. Here's three syllables, bi, so, ne. We're assigning this LH melody, so low then high. It's going from left to right, so L goes to B. H goes to so, but then we see that ne is not going to have any tone assigned to it, so we spread our previous tone over to it, so we get beat, uh, beat so ne, so low, high, high. So on your assignment, let me just pull that up. You have a question on Yama Tone where you're told to read a, a web page and then attach certain prefixes to it. So this is what you'll be doing. Um, you'll be showing some words, showing the word melody, writing out the little structure for it, and then basically showing how things attach. So if you have a high low and two syllables, you might attach them like this. Let's say you're attaching another suffix to it. It's a high suffix, and then there's some rule changes. What you might do is you might delink something and then spread some tones over. So now instead of this being high, low, high, uh, this ends up being a high, high, low, because we've spread H over, we've spread L over, and we've essentially delinked the original tones by slashing through it. So that's how we can do that question on the assignment. So to illustrate this, Here's a word process. So here we're starting with some tones. And what we're saying is that if the word ends in a final long vowel, we're going to shorten the vowel and reduce its tone to an H if it was HH or HL. So we'll go through this rule. And this is from an official conlang. This is their rule. But we'll show you how we can do this more linguistically, a nicer way to analyze this. So this is taking someone's conlang that they've created and then finding a nicer linguistic analysis for it, which is interesting. So. Uh, shorten the vowel and reduce its tone to H. So basically what's happening here is we have a high tone, it's still being spread, but then we're getting rid of our final vowel and reducing the tone. So this H that used to be there, attaching to the last sound, is being delinked, it's being destroyed. And what's happening is that vowel sound is going with it. So you can think of it as just delink the last tone, and then you're good. If there's a vowel attached to it, get rid of the vowel um, if, if there's no tone associated with it. So we'd have i left over, there's no tone, we get rid of it. In the case of this last one, this is more interesting. So ki, tra, sa. And if we take a look at the tones here, we can do the same thing. We can keep the ll on the ki and tra. But then we're told to shorten the final vowel. So we're going to reduce the HL tone to just an L tone. Sorry, to just an H tone. So we're just going to delink the last tone. And then we're going to be left with a low, low, high. We don't get this high, low on the final vowel anymore. That HL has been reduced to an H. So there's a nice way to account for this rule. And this is just delink the last tone. So if you take a look at the tonal tier above, all we're doing is just eliminating that last tone if we're ending with a high, low, or a high, high. We just get rid of the last tone, and then it works out. So this is a word process, a phonological process, where words are changing according to their environment, but you could use this for meaning too, and it's just a nice systematic procedure. Start with something, um, follow rules, get something new. So another conlang uses three pitches, high, medium, and low. And there's a bunch of different rules for this. So a nouns, adjective, verbs, and interjections like hello, hey, wow, those have high pitch. 
Other words don't have high pitch. Every one syllable word is an L pitch. If there is a multi-syllable word, high pitch lands on the second to last syllable. And in compounds words, the root remains high and everything else that is high turns to uh, medium or mid. So if I had a word like single, this is a two syllable word. It says that H lands on the penultimate syllable. So second to last syllable. So we'd end up with an HL syllable here. In the case of forming a compound word, so we have three bits, sad, pinto, and lemco. So this is high, 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 and then high. Originally, we have a couple lows here as well. And what we're told is that the root stays high. So this is gonna stay high, but all of the other highs are gonna become mediums, so mids. So we have a mid there. Uh, the I in pint is gonna be mid. Uh, we have some sort of change here where we're getting a low high connecting these words. So this is just a vowel that's being changed. So there's some other process here happening with this E and then O is remaining low. So the changes we've made are here and here while well, keeping it high in the root and then reducing highs to mediums everywhere else. So another process that uses previous words and tones to create new words. Now we're going to do stress at the end because stress is above the tone layer. This combines pitch, length, and loudness. So you can think of this as even above the tone tier. Uh, words have primary stress and secondary stress. So if you heard, hear a word like explanation, uh, the nay in that word is longer, it's louder, and there's a higher pitch. So it's not just like we're going explanation, explanation with higher pitch. We're also making it a little bit longer. So we can do this by putting a little accent above the vowel, or if we're doing IPA transcriptions, we just put a little um, apostrophe-like symbol above it. Secondary stress is pretty similar, it's just not as pronounced as primary stress, and it appears two syllables away. So here's what's happening with stress. We have the syllable layer, so I took the word explanation and I wrote our syllables down. So explanation, I didn't write out all of these bits, but that's okay. So above the tone layer, so this is where you would have your highs and lows, you have what's called the foot layer. And what feet are, feet take two syllables and they combine them into a bigger unit. So you can think of this as like a grouping of syllables. And in each foot, one syllable is going to get stress. So in the case of explanation, the left syllables are getting stress and this is consistent. So every syllable, um, sorry, every foot will assign stress in the same direction. And above the foot layer, all of the feet come together to form with what's called a prosodic word. And the prosodic word is what assigns primary stress. So whatever gets the double line gets primary stress, whatever doesn't will get secondary stress on those, on those feet. So in the case of explanation, we're saying that the second syllable has primary stress and the leftmost syllable is the one that has that stress. So nay is the primary stress syllable. In this case, this is a foot connected to a prosodic word that is not double linked. So this means it's going to get secondary stress and the left side is going to get it. So it's going to be ek. So explanation, explanation. You get this sort of bouncing back pattern. Explanation, explanation. Kind of like a pendulum. So the things that you can manipulate in your language are like which syllables get put into feet. Is it two syllables per feet, which is standard, or do you want to do three or just one? Uh, which sides of the, of the foot are getting stress? In the prosodic word, which side gets stress? Is it the right side, the left side, the middle? Like, what's happening? So you have a lot of tools here. So how you can think about these when you assign stress is to think about these as different arguments. So you're going to assign syllables to each foot from either left to right or right to left. Uh, the first or last syllable can be skipped for foot assignment, and each foot is assigning stress to one side. So in English, what we can do is we can choose this pattern to get the words that we want. Now, we still need to do prosodic word on the right side in order to get primary stress right, but we could use the set of rules to get English captured for the most part. So if we had a new word, 
like o e k ka ki go gu so let's just set up syllables for each of these and let's do some stress assignment based on some arbitrary rules we got and see what happens so we're going to assign syllables to each foot from right to left we're going to do them in pairs but we're going to start from the right we're going to skip the last syllable so here's how we're going to do our feet so this is a foot this is a foot this is a foot uh, the last syllable is skipped so it's not going to be part of our foot structure but we can add it to our prosodic word we're saying each foot assigns stress to the right side so we know that the stress syllables are going to be ki ka and go we didn't say which one has primary stress so i'm going to say for primary stress let's do it on the left so this means that our primary stress is going to be ki our secondary stress is going to be sa and our secondary stress is going to be go so it'd be like saying okike ka kikogu so something like that. Now, what would happen if the last syllable was not extra metrical? So in other words, we're not skipping it. How would this structure change? Well, what we can do is we can uh, do some copy and pasting here so we can keep this one on the screen. So that's the old one. And now for the new one, how is this gonna change? Well, we're going to assign feet here, here, here. Uh, we're going to have to give the last syllable its own foot because it can't fit into anything. Uh, and this is going to form a prosodic word. I said the one on the left is the one that's going to get primary stress. And then each of these syllables, it's uh, the right foot is getting stress. So out of all of these, we're going to get primary stress on O now. Secondary on K, uh, secondary on Ki, and secondary on Gu. So this would be like saying, Oh, Ki Ke Ki, Oh, Ki Ke Kaki Go Gu, Oh, Ki Ke Kaki Go Gu. So primary stress on that O. So just by changing which, whether or not the final syllable is skipped or not in the equation is giving us a different set of primary and secondary stress. So you can play around with this until you have something that you like. You can make the rules as simple or as complicated as you want. But, you know, tone, syllables, uh, stress, it, it's a very complicated system that I'm trying to give you the rundown in less than two hours. Because it's recorded, like, really less than one hour. So if you're workshop this week, uh, it's working on phono tactics, which will be for your conlang check-in. So what sound combinations will you allow? Which ones won't you allow? What types of syllables do you want? And do you want any tone? So tone, stress, pitch. Are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? So you don't have to submit this. Um, instead, what I want you to do is work on the conlang check-in and the assignment. So the first assignment is due next week, June 1st, and the check-in will be due seven days after that. So for your check-in, you're going to write up a grammar guide. So you've been seeing some in the assignments. You can pick one that you like, or in some of the lecture slides, you can pick any format you like. Um, but what you need to do is include the following. A phonemic inventory of 5 to 70 sounds. A system for your phonotactics that explains how they work. A syllable system that explains how it works with some examples. And then if you're doing super segmentals, to explain those as well and show off some examples. So you have a list of what you need to do for each section. Remember, this is a grammar guide, so it should be written up more formally, not so much point for me. You can do point form explanations if that's the style you like, um, but just make sure things are clear. So the grading is more so for consistency, writing style, and linguistic accuracy. So as long as you're writing accurately with what you're doing and you're explaining what you're doing and being consistent and have a nice style, that's really what matters. So if you have any questions about this content or the lecture, feel free to email me. Um, I'll also have office hours next week as usual. And then um, in lecture, we can recover anything that you might want to know more about. So... Yeah, sorry for this week, and I'll see you next week.